of LDC graduation in Bangladesh. And at the very outset, um, we have a host of speakers here. We have with us Dr. Mustafa Abid Khan. We have Ms. Yasim Bekal from uh, UN Technology Bank, Mr. Abul Qasim Khan, Chairperson. After the remarks, we have our Honorable Secretary, Ministry of Commerce, uh, and uh, Mr. Tofiqur Rahman from the WTO, uh, board member of WTO, and our today's guest of honor, uh, Syed Manzur Lahi. And uh, at the very outset, I'm going to request uh, the Secretary, Ministry of Commerce, Mr. Tapan Kanti Ghosh, to deliver his introductory remarks and set the dialogue uh, tone today. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. I think uh, you hear me. Yes. Honorable, Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Ahmad Kaikaus, Principal Secretary to the Honorable Prime Minister, Government of Bangladesh, Distinguished Guest of Honor, Mr. Syed Nasim Manju, Syed uh, Manju Elahi, Chairman, Apex Group and former advisor, Caretaker Government, Session Chair, Mr. Vijayan Rahman, President, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Mustafa Abid Khan, former member of BTTC, Mr. Tofiku Rahman, board member, World Trade Organization, Mr. Abul Kashim Khan, Chairperson Bill, and former president DCCI, Ms. Esim Baikal, program management officer, United Nations Technology Bank for LDCs. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, including loss of unilateral duty-free market access, increased tariff rates, increased competition at both local and international market, standard and quality, stringent rules of origin, skills upgradation, and compliance issues. Alongside, the graduation will also generate ample opportunities in many respects, including private sector development, enriched industrial base, increased foreign investment, etc. The government has taken the economic shift seriously and is working to frame necessary solutions. In this regard, the government has formed a national committee headed by Principal Secretary to the Honorable Prime Minister, and some subcommittees are also engaging private and the public sector organization and stakeholders for necessary reforms and to formulate action plans to ensure a smooth transition. To overcome our transition and harness potential of the economic transformation, we have to take bold steps of tariff rationalization and internal, internal resource mobilization. At the same time, we need to conclude free trade agreements with major trading partners to retain and extend the market access of our products. We also need huge FDI and technology transfer for economic diversification and improving productive capacity. The government authorities and the private sector are working in tandem, taking those challenges into consideration for the best interest of the country. Alongside, we are working closely with WTO, UNCTAD, and other UN bodies to secure extended international support measures for the graduated LDCs, including Bangladesh, to ensure our transition with momentum. Ladies and gentlemen, 
we look forward to thoughtful views of our distinguished discussion special guests about the likely course of action on a smooth transition of the country towards our long cherished economic milestone i would like to thank again all esteemed guests and participants particularly principal secretary to the honorable prime minister for joining us and making this event a success thank you all thank you very much thank you sir thank you mr secretary uh, thank you for setting the tone of today's dialogue um, due to an emergency meeting of the honorable prime minister's cabinet unfortunately today's chief guest dr ahmed kaikaus the honorable principal secretary to the prime minister will have to leave us early however we are very thankful to the principal secretary for his kind presence despite his busy schedule so uh, we i would like to inform the speakers that observing all protocols i would now humbly like to request dr ahmed kaikaus the honorable principal secretary to deliver his address as the chief guest of today's event over to you sir thank you i'm sorry um i am violating the uh, standard protocol uh, actually most importantly i am going to miss the uh, rich discussion uh, that i uh, envision that is going to um, be held uh, in, in this august gathering because i see um, very renowned as well as experienced and contributing business leaders uh, in the uh, history of bangladesh like mr Manzur Elahi and others who has changed the country uh, in many aspects, especially in the uh, field of business, especially what we call trade and investment. That is the theme of the summit. Um, well, I'm skipping. I'm sorry uh, for the uh, sake of time. I'm skipping the standard uh, way of addressing the distinguished guests. um uh, in general actually everybody is in uh, distinguished guests so uh, distinguished guests and uh, dear participants good morning first of all i would like to congratulate uh, dcci and uh, ministry of commerce for taking this step i think um uh, what the commerce secretary has mentioned uh, about the growth of bangladesh which is very known to everyone um but that is not enough that we consider and for that what we need is to uh move forward and create a congenial atmosphere for which the business community leaders and the businesses at home and abroad feel better for investment and trade in bangladesh obviously uh, this is probably uh, i think a uh, thousand times uh, in my life i have been uh, mentioning that 81% of our gdp comes from the private sector and 2019% is contributed by the government uh, but i think our government as a government we are very uh, powerful and that is why all of you are uh, i think the uh, hate us uh, for our power so i think we need to reduce our power turn into friendship so that this 81% can be uh, more vibrant and also be uh, effective because the creativity and the growth momentum uh, government is the facilitator but the momentum as well as the creativity belongs to the private and i think the government of bangladesh uh, realizes it especially the honorable prime minister uh, greatly believes uh, in the strength of the private sector for which she has opened up the private sector to uh, uh, i mean in many sectors which were considered the private sector uh, cannot or uh, 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 everybody considered that it was impossible for the private sector to invest uh, i can name you a few number 1 is the power sector it is a heavily capital intensive uh, sector uh, for which uh, we had an idea that other than the foreign investors bangladeshis cannot invest but if you look into the power sector now the leading private sectors those who are in the power generation are from bangladeshi entrepreneurs 
So I think we have uh, shown uh, that the even highly capital intensive and technological intense technology intensive sectors can also be built uh, very efficiently by our private sector. So I uh, I consider this summit is uh, sort of like you know uh, opening up uh, the <clears throat> um, barrier. I mean uh, pointing out the barriers, opening up the discussion, and trying to find out solutions. That should be our goal. And I think this will continue and we'd be happy to get the feedback from you, the uh, points that has been discussed. And, uh, you know, uh, if you put this forward to us, that would be great because um, at least I can tell you on behalf of the Honorable Prime Minister that she is willing to listen to the stakeholders um, who are going to be benefited and who are going to deal the subjects, especially uh, investment and trade. Who, who, these are the market pillars, I mean, the uh, pillars of our economy and where uh, the private sector uh, is the is in the uh, in charge and the government is the facilitating agency. So we want to continue with this model. And uh, I would like to actually, I'm, I would be very happy to continue with this, but if I'm looking into my clock, and uh, uh, that is making me nervous because I have to uh, reach uh, from my office to Donovan. Otherwise, I might reach uh, after the Honorable Prime Minister after, uh, arrives, which I don't want to take the risk. But with all my uh, uh, heart, I would be very happy and I hope to actually listen to other um, you know, um, seminars uh, in future so that I should be benefited. I don't think that I have anything to add to your wisdom. Rather, I would be very happy to listen to you to know your wisdom, experience, and your suggestion. So I look forward to uh, having a further discussion with all of you. But I again beg apology for uh, for this short intervention. I would like to actually, I'd be very happy to uh, show my uh, sort of like, you know, how brilliant I am uh, to understand the private sector. But unfortunately, I am I have I don't have the opportunity more. So I beg leave and thank you very much. I uh, wish all the uh, all success in your uh, you know uh, next hours or so or a couple of hours, and then I'd be uh, happy to listen to you in future. Thank you very much, Jai Ram. Thank you, Mr. Principal Secretary. We will definitely share the outcome report with you at the earliest, as soon as the discussion's over. And we once again thank you for joining us despite your busy schedule. But however, you and both the Commerce Secretary have set the tone. And I look forward to sharing the details of the discussion with you. Thank you very much, sir. At this point of time, um, let me uh, bring in uh, Mr. Tofiku Rahman. He's a board member of the WTO and EIF. Of course, being a responsible person for overseeing the systemic issues of interest uh, of LDCs in the WTO, as well as supporting the senior management on negotiations of the LDC issues. I'm humbly requesting you to share the practical experience of other LDC graduated nations, um, their economic trade and export policy for export diversification and coping with the new environment. And uh, however, will there be any scope for increasing support measures of LDC later graduation? And also within your uh, stipulated time, if you can say how the future PTA and FTA can be made more effective. Over to you, Mr. Tofiku Rahman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rizwan Rahman, the president of the CCI. Thank you for your kind words, for your kind introduction, and for your kind invitation. We commend the initiative of the CCI led by you in, in advancing the discussion on LDC graduation. Um, first of all, I have to say that it's a it's a privilege and an honor to be part of this distinguished panel, um, and I'm highly encouraged by the remarks of the Principal Secretary to the Honorable Prime Minister, the Commerce Secretary. Also encouraged to see the pioneers of our private sector uh, joining this session. Uh, the questions that you have posed to me um, are a bit uh, uh, tall in order. I would uh, humbly try to address them. Um, I think uh, by now. There is a common knowledge about uh, the issues uh, surrounding uh, graduation. 
um, it is good to see the the seriousness uh, with which the government and the and the private sector are examining the issues of graduation and there is increased understanding in the country and uh, stakeholder consultation is happening regularly this is quite uh, commendable i must say that the meeting of uh, graduation thresholds uh, is a milestone uh, uh, in the development journey of any ldc uh, why i say this because bangladesh has achieved this milestone in a remarkable manner because bangladesh has met all the three criteria used by uh, the uncdp for graduation and not only once uh, two consecutive reviews and uh, why i say this and i think the commerce secretary has also alluded to that that we now see a strong foundation of our economy because despite the shock induced uh, uh, by global economy there has been a positive economic performance in the country and and bangladesh has done better than many economies uh, it has posted a gdp growth rate of 3.6% when many economies uh, decline and and let me underline the significance of this statement because uh, when the world economy contracted by uh, 3% bangladesh experienced a growth rate of 3.5% and it's only around the world 14 economies that experienced such economic growth so this is quite a remarkable performance and bangladesh has shown resilience uh, to the covid-19 even they have also shown resilience earlier in the economic crisis in 2008-9 when the gdp growth rate posted a, um, a rate of 5% and above now uh, in this context we have to see the the graduation uh, that is imminent um we know that trade is an important area where ldcs receive uh, favorable treatment uh, and definitely um, the main related trade related challenge will stem from loss of preferences and and reduced flexibility in in wto rules now let me also highlight one point um, as uh, the president of the bcci has mentioned the bangladesh is not comparable with other graduated ldcs and and that is why Bangladesh is a classic example of how graduation would impact a particular LDC. Um, let me explain it um, in this way. Uh, first of all, Bangladesh is the top exporter uh, in the LDC group. You know, used to be uh, some oil exporting LDCs in the past, Equatorial Guinea, Angola, but Bangladesh has overtaken them and is now the top exporter in the LDC group. Also, I mean, when I talk about the exporter, we're talking about merchandise exports, but also among the top five uh, commercial services exporters. Bangladesh uses preferences a lot. European Union is our main trading partner. More than half of our exports go to European Union and is the biggest beneficiary of EBA. So when graduation uh, is imminent, there are some implications because uh, you use preferences which others are not using to that extent. And let me explain with one thing that all graduated economies so far were small in size, both in terms of population and economy. We're talking about Botswana, Cabo Verde, Samoa, Equatorial Guinea, Vanuatu, and Maldives. And you can see four uh, of these six are island economies, and, and the rest of them are not necessarily manufacturing exporters. None of these economies has more than 2.5 million uh, inhabitants compared to more than 164 million for Bangladesh. Their GDP in 2020 ranged from US dollar 800 million to 16 billion compared to almost US dollar 330 billion for Bangladesh. And if you put it differently, it's Bangladesh economy is 10 times larger than the cumulative share of the six graduated LDCs so far. So you can see that uh, the impact and the scope and magnitude of uh, implications would differ for Bangladesh compared to other uh, graduating LDCs. Now, the, with the exception, now I come to the experience of trade regime of LDCs after graduation. And as I said, most of the LDCs that have graduated so far was not using preferences to a great extent. They were exporting oils or minerals or primary commodities, which in any case attract low duties in their export markets. So this was not a big issue for them. Obviously, there was a particular case of Maldives and when they export tuna to European Union, they used to receive a lot of preference margin, but they have also adjusted to that uh, with, with their trading partner. And in fact, I'll come to that point when the EBS scheme introduced a transition period for graduated LDCs to, to support the graduated LDCs. 
So today, um, the with the exception of the European Union and United Kingdom, uh, graduation related provisions are absent in the GSP schemes or preference schemes of members. Um, and, and the central question uh, to Bangladesh and to other graduating LDCs, there are 16 graduating LDCs on the pipeline. Um, obviously, Bangladesh and a few others um, will graduate as per the current recommendations in 2026. For others, uh, the, the timeline is a bit different. But the central question for all graduating LDCs is how to maintain the LDC type preferences after graduation. So if we are exporting a duty free quota fee basis to European Union, to Canada, to Japan, um, how can we maintain that preference? The answer is not simple because there will not be a perfect substitute uh, for what you have been enjoying now. And then the strategy has to be different depending on the markets. For instance, and I think there has been a lot of discussion in, in Bangladesh and also in the international forum about uh, the how can you access a similar preferences to European Union market and people talk about GSP plus GSP plus uh, also comes with some conditions and also you can also think of uh, negotiating an FTA or any other economic arrangements but then this is again a case for Bangladesh how you want to engage with the European Union it's not necessarily immediate because as per the European Union provisions you can continue to enjoy preferences till 2029 so Bangladesh has time uh, to think of uh, uh, its uh, relations uh, uh, with the European Union. But when you look at the Bangladesh export structure, you'll see that, yes, more than 50% of the exports go to European Union, but around 15% maybe go to the United States, uh, some 7% go to the U United Kingdom, um, and then the rest of the markets, it, the share ranges between 2 to 3%. So, for some countries, you have a preferential trade relations. For some countries, you are exporting to regional trade agreements. For some countries, it's normal trade relations or what in WTO we call uh, MFN uh, trade. So for some other markets other than the European Union, again, it has to be a market specific strategy because Canada or Japan doesn't have a GSP plus scheme and they do not have a favorable scheme than the LDC scheme when you enter into a developing country status because you will only have access to their a standard developing country GSP. So whether for these markets, you, you need a different approach, this is the uh, strategy that the government will have to undertake. So uh, let me come to the third point, and I think then I'll stop here, and there are so many distinguished speakers, I also want to listen from them. Every transition will come with challenge. And the, uh, the question is about awareness of those challenges and, and preparing to, to embrace the, the new status. Because it is only in this way and it is only with the adequate preparations that the economy uh, will be resilient and, and stronger in the post-graduation landscape of uh, any country. The, the first thing is that you, I think the, uh, the government as well as the private sector and our other stakeholders, you, you have an exit timeline with, within which you are working and so definitely there has to be an exit strategy because there is no looking back uh, uh, because the aim of the government should be to reach the next year of development. And as far the graduation uh, process, if Bangladesh moves to the developing country status, you cannot go back to the LDC status because our population size will, will not allow that to happen. And why should a country go back to the LDC status when they have already moved to the next stage of development? So. A strategy has to be taken of how to make a, a medium and long term uh, growth plan and, and then uh, build on from the uh, success as a socioeconomic success that the country has achieved uh, over the last years. What will require as far as trade issues are concerned is to build a negotiating capacity because the world everywhere is moving from unilateral to reciprocal type of trade arrangements. Uh, so far, the LDCs have been benefiting from unilateral preferences, but very soon, uh, when you are no longer an LDC, obviously you can still have uh, access to standard uh, GSP schemes of countries uh, that is available for developing countries. But in order to get deeper preferences, in order to get uh, uh, privileged access, you have to enter into negotiations. And uh, Commerce Secretary has talked about the FTA negotiations. 
um, those negotiations are not necessarily great. It cuts across broad areas of economic life. So a lot of capacity is needed uh, in order to engage in those negotiations. The final point I want to make is that the, there is also a responsibility of the international community to help ensure a smooth and, and sustainable graduation. And, uh, and uh, my friend uh, Joshua Setipa, the Managing Director of the United Nations Technology Bank, I see he's here for this program. Uh, there are uh, transition provisions available for graduated LDCs in certain uh, technical assistance programs, in certain facilities, in certain programs, and they range from three to five years. So once you graduate from LDC status, you continue to benefit from those programs for an extended period of three to five years. I talked about the European Union and UK. They also extend preferences to graduated LDCs uh, once they graduate from the status for a period of three years. But uh, the international community should reflect more on how they can give uh, post-graduation international support measures to LDCs. I want to say that in the WTO, uh, the LDC group has submitted a proposal and uh, uh, there's a ministerial conference coming up in uh, end of November. Uh, right now, uh, different consultations are happening. LDCs have asked uh, the preference granting members to phase out the LDC preferences uh, from a period of six to nine years after graduation. This is being discussed with members. We will see whether we have an outcome in November. Um, even if there is no outcome, the issue will continue to be discussed in the WTO in the years ahead. And I only hope that uh, uh, we are able to help graduating LDCs um, the final point is that uh, we, the international community, should take into account the individual circumstances of LDCs uh, uh, as they embrace graduation, and that graduation should not become a force uh, for disruption in the development trajectory of any graduating LDC. I will stop here, uh, President of the DCCI, and the floor is back to you. Thank you. Thank you. We have learned a lot and we have taken uh, down quite a few notes that you have mentioned, but uh, you did mention the trade negotiations. We are eventually going to hear from Dr. Mustafa Abid Khan, who is a trade policy analyst as well as a trade negotiator. But before that, you also mentioned the um, UN Tech Bank. Um, I had the pleasure of hosting Mr. Joshua Satipa at Dhaka Chamber, I think last week or just a few days before that. And we, the the core end of the discussion came to such that tech transfer is no longer a choice. It's a necessity. So at this point of time, we have with us the program management officer of the UN Technology Bank for LDCs, Ms. Yasim Baker. And I would like to hear from Yasim about the views on how UNTB can extend uh, technological attachment and, of course, uh, engagement in uh, which is necessary for supporting graduating countries and above all, the preparedness, implementation, and the effectiveness of technology transfer for a nation like ours, how that can be helpful. Ms. Baker, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope you're all hearing me well. First of all, I would like to thank the ministry and uh, DCCI for organizing this and for inviting us to participate at this important meeting. Uh, it is uh, actually very timely, but as Mr. Rizwan Rahman said, we were recently in Bangladesh, so we had the opportunity to observe uh, on the ground and uh, have very useful consultations with different stakeholders uh, on the side of the government, also on the side of the private sector. Uh, and uh, we were, I'm really honored to be here today, and it is a, it is a very interesting topic, and as I, as I say, very timely and useful. So I'll, first, I will say a few words on the on the Technology Bank, uh, a brief background. It's a United Nations agency. It's established uh, by a General Assembly resolution. And we started functioning in the beginning of 2019. So it is uh, quite new, I should say. Uh, it's a little different from the other United Nations agencies. We are focusing on more on the implementation side of things. So, uh, and we are uh, focusing on the LDCs, which are now 46 countries all around the world. Bangladesh is. Of, uh, has been one of them and uh, close to graduation. Of course, graduation of, of the LDCs is of a concern for the bank too, 
because we want the, our support to continue and uh, we want them to be successful uh, after they graduate and our work uh, in that regard is also important. Uh, what are we trying to do? What is our focus in the LDCs? We work on uh, capacity building, on science, technology, and innovation, on tech transfer, on uh, science academies, uh, on uh, research institutions, uh, academic institutions, and we want to uh, the LDCs to have the capacity uh, to uh, to research to innovate on their own after also from the, after the graduation too. now what are we doing with regard to bangladesh uh, we are uh, we have the technology needs assessment project that is now uh, ongoing uh, with bangladesh so what we're trying to do is we uh, we collaborate with the bangladeshi government mainly to identify the areas where the Bangladesh would need technological solutions uh, for the problems. Of course, there, compared to other LDCs, there is innovation, a lot of innovation going on in Bangladesh, ma mainly on the IT sector. But we, IT now has become a, like a cost-cutting issue. It's uh, relevant for all the technology sectors, like agriculture, like health, like education. So uh but we are uh, we are focusing on uh, the sectors where it's uh, there is a pri priority for the Bangladeshi uh, authorities and we're also having a project now with the UNDP and the Turkish government on uh, called the SDG impact accelerator where we focus on financial inclusion in Bangladesh, and we have uh, selected two startups uh, from Bangladesh, where we're helping them with a, a grant. It's a hundred thousand dollars for each to implement their solutions in Bangladesh. These are on financial inclusion. Of course, we're also we want to support the LDCs in their tech transfer related activities. Uh, what we're doing on that, we're working on uh, developing a building a platform. This will be a digital platform. We're working with the U.S. Uh, government and U.S. authorities on this one, where the LDCs will have access to technology, uh, meaning that technology information and if uh, applicable technology transfer. But uh, technology transfer on its own, you, it's not just in, enough to have access to technology information. You also need the services around technology transfer, which will be like funding on legal issues, on intellectual property, on licensing issues. So we want to also facilitate the access of the LDCs to these kinds of services to our platform. In our... Uh, work uh, also the support of course are given to the current ldcs but the support of the tech bank to the ldcs uh, will continue five years after the graduation and i know as uh, indicated by uh, the board member from wto there are uh, proposals uh, on the table uh, that to make that uh, for a longer time the service should continue for a longer time also to uh, continue the support of the ldc's after the graduation especially with the, what has been happening with COVID uh, pandemic it has become more challenging for the countries to uh, to adapt themselves to the conditions uh, after graduating from the ldc status now, uh, I will specifically focus on technology transfer because technology transfer is very important. Uh, also in, important in diff on different levels. First of all, of course, uh, for uh, all the challenges, almost all the challenges, you need technologies. This is uh, ranging from health, like water, education, you need technologies. And but to be able to starting to innovate for a country to starting to innovate on their own, they first need technology, 
technology transfer. They have to because adaptation of a technology to local conditions also innovation. And this is very important. I mean, technology transfer teaches a lot. Uh, and when you have a successful technology transfer, it, uh, it also builds the block for innovation. So that is very important. And uh, when I was preparing for this uh, presentation today, I also wanted to check uh, how Bangladesh is do doing on innovation. Maybe you're aware there is a global innovation and index published by the World Intellectual Property Organization every year. And they rank the countries on their uh, innovation uh, capacity as uh, ecosystem for innovation. How, how is it in the country? They look at the performance. And I looked for Bangladesh. It's interesting because they rank 132 countries around the world, LDC or developed, developing doesn't matter. And uh, Bangladesh has been doing very well on uh, best in knowledge and technology output. This is interesting. It's uh, it's uh, nine. It's ranked 92 uh, among 132. Uh, this is this is also in line what we have observed in Bangladesh. There is a willingness and uh, to uh, to innovate, especially in the IT sector. And there are very successful startups, very young and dynamic uh, startup uh, environment. But I also looked where, where is the weakness? What is the weakness? And I found that it's uh, among 132, Bangladesh is 128 for human capital and research. This is also very important. That means uh, the capacity the, the to, for, for the human, uh, the ca human capacity has to be further developed and further supported. And research, this means the universities, uh, what is the investment uh, in education? So this has to be, an, this is an area where there has to be maybe more focus before graduation. And uh, that's also in line what uh, my personal observation, for example, we had a very brief discussion with the academic uh, institutions, uh, the leading universities, and we have observed that, uh, for example, technology transfer offices are not uh, fully developed. Uh, and this is very important, especially on a national level, also for exporting your technologies, uh, to have uh, the connection between the research uh, institutions and the industry. This is relevant not just for uh, IT, for all kinds of technologies, but also I think Bangladesh in the future looks like it will be a country who would want to uh, export its IT. Uh, I think they're already doing that uh, with some uh, technologies. And uh, for that purpose, the, this connection, this uh, awareness on technology transfer uh, is very important for Bangladesh. This involves, of course, intellectual property systems, uh, especially after graduation. Uh, you want uh, technologies, advanced, real advanced, sophisticated technologies to come to Bangladesh. There has to be a very reliable and uh, I don't want to say detailed, but uh, well-working IP system. This involves the uh, legislation, this involves the uh, capacity building in the intellectual property issues, uh, being able to protect your innovation in the country as well as outside of the country, in the countries you want to market your technology and to build awareness on that issue. And uh, especially for countries, I'll give you an example, Japan or Korea, they would uh, they would open up the share of their technologies and they look at the also the legislation and the practice on the ground. What are the what are the rules on the ground for intellectual property? Will they be when they bring in technology, when they're being bring their know-how, will they be able to protect that in the country? And how much should they open up? And and just having access to patent information for innovation would never be enough. There has to be a sharing of the know-how, even in some cases, the trade secrets, opening up those 
for uh, for the countries to uh, fully utilize the technology, implement the technology, and being able to innovate themselves. I'll also touch upon shortly on the uh, this uh, Article 66.2 of the TRIPS uh, Convention in the WTO. This is the tra intellect trade uh, related uh, intellectual property rights. And uh, Article 66.2 says that for the least developed countries, there is a uh, the developed countries should create incentives to facilitate tech transfer. To be honest, I mean, there is someone from the WTO, but this has not been uh, fully utilized, this article. I mean, uh, the developed countries are supposed to create incentives, but up to now, and because I've also worked at, uh, I was representing my country, Turkey, at the trips negotiations, up to now, it has not... Uh, uh, come to a level where there is really support uh, for transferring technology to the LDCs. This has been uh, criticized. So uh, I don't think there will be, I mean, of course, uh, Bangladesh will not be able to maybe benefit from this article, but I think Bangladesh also has other opportunities. And this is mainly up to now has been focusing on training and other issues. Uh, not too many actual technology transfer uh, has uh, taken place. Also on this, uh, uh, on technology transfer, uh, for uh, gradu after graduation, uh, the mechanisms and the structures on the ground are very important. As I, as I said, technology transfer offices, a special mechanism, a structure for technology transfer, and awareness in the community, especially startup community on intellectual property rights, focusing on uh, also their issues that has to be protected, like traditional knowledge, genetic resources. These are very important issues, especially for the LDC in developing countries, because uh, genetic resources are usually for con con countries like Bangladesh and others. Uh, are a rich uh, value, but there's not have been many opportunities or awareness on how you can protect your genetic resources and uh, they then become a resource. Okay, so I want, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, so this is uh, what, I, but we're continuing supporting Bangladesh. This is just, just one event. So, uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak at this important meeting. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Yasim. This is one of the many first events and <clears throat> we look forward to the UN Tech Bank's uh, involvement deeply in supporting the graduation, especially uh, with an emerging IT sector. When we spoke about the intellectual property rights, the uh, tech transfer is very important and how technology has advanced in Bangladesh. The first success story itself is the Bangladesh Trade and Investment Summit, which congregated 552 businesses from 38 countries. Without technology, that wouldn't have been possible. We have completed 112 meetings as of midnight yesterday. And as of today, 135 meetings are being conducted right here in DCCI, all virtually. And this is because of technology and of course, the adaptation, uh, as for DCCI is concerned, they are well adapted to technology, but there's more to learn. So, of course, we look forward to your support and, of course, collaborate with you in any way possible when it comes to entrepreneurship or enterprise development. At this point of time, I would like to bring in Mr. Abul Qasim Khan. Mr. Abul Qasim Khan is the chairperson of Business Initiative and Leading Development. He's the first public-private dialogue platform. He also represents AK Khan and Company, a company that goes back beyond Bangladesh, more than 50 years. I would like to uh, request Mr. Khan, who is not only a uh, 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 prominent businessman, but also my predecessor and a former president of Dhaka Chamber. Uh, he has an experience in a wide range of business, uh, diversified holding company. And of course, uh, as they deal with a wide range of uh, policy making and uh, economic strength and preparedness that is required to address the challenges during the LDC graduation, we would like him to share his valuable experience, not only regarding the private sector, but as for the policy support as well. Mr. Khan. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Am I audible? Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm honored to be here um, 
in this session, uh, LDC graduation of Bangladesh transformation and preparedness. Um, I think we all know about the challenges and the opportunities, so I will not go into the details. Uh, I would touch upon uh, four broad areas where I think uh, the policy planners and, and, and the government uh, should focus on. One is uh, protect jobs and create jobs. I mean, what are the challenges that will uh, be coming due to the LDC uh, graduation process? So Bangladesh being a large country in terms of population, it is very important for the policies to support uh, job creation. So that is one. Number two is expanding the economic freedom. I think um, create avenues of economic freedom for all Bangladeshis by uh, basically reforming the age old systems and processes and procedures uh, that we have currently. I mean, the, the, the reform process needs to be accelerated. I think from the business community, we have been uh, continuously talking with the government to expedite the reform processes, uh, simplification of business processes, which includes your taxation system, your company registration. I think those need to be accelerated. Number three is increasing trade and investment, uh, creating opportunities for investment. Uh, industry diversification uh, will automatically lead to your export diversification. So that is something which is at the core of the government's policy, but I think there are certain loopholes and bottlenecks that we need to uh, overcome. And that, that is where the expanding of the economic freedom comes in. And fourth, which I think is very important, is building new competitive areas for Bangladesh and comparative advantages. I think our uh, uh, competitiveness uh, needs to be expanded in other sectors. And based on these four uh, focus areas, uh, I, I would, I would, my recommendation or my suggestions from where I'm, I'm coming at would be obviously policy reform, deregulation, including uh, new policy support that needs to take shape for greater opportunities. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, competitive tax policy, business friendly tax uh, systems, lowering uh, of the taxes at various level, increasing our tax net. Uh, uh, these are the main areas that needs reforms. And as you know, Bangladesh, uh, in terms of size of the economy, our tax to GDP is very low. So broadening of the tax uh, system needs to uh, needs to increase. Ease of doing business is something very important, which we are always talking about. Uh, we need to be better than uh, Vietnam. We need to be better than India. So higher targets with certain deadlines, timelines. You know, you set the time frame. What you want to be within 2024 or 2025. So keeping that, those deadlines should be a priority for the, for the government. Uh, free trade, professional trade agreements, the ASEAN market access, regional integration, RCEP, BIMS, like these are all very important for Bangladesh to explore. I think Dr. Tropic already mentioned, I don't want to uh, go into details, but these are areas where Bangladesh needs to explore. I think th there are certain FTAs coming up. Uh, RCEP is an interesting uh, formation that is coming in, in the regional context. So Bangladesh may gain in the long term for the, from these uh, regional uh, associations. Uh, the scope of FT, as I mentioned, is very, very, very important. But at the same time, we need to do some deep dive. What are the strengths of Bangladesh and what are the weaknesses that we need to overcome? These are very important to understand because we need to, at the end of the day, create business or create wealth for our uh, businesses or for our citizens. And wealth creation should be a top priority within the LDC. A roadmap. Number two would be domestic industry diversification. Extremely important for domestic industry to diversify, which will automatically lead to export diversification. Um, and, and how do you do that? Uh, we have a very proven track record on the RMG model. RMG took about 30 years uh, from where, where it started till today. But we cannot duplicate the RMG model in terms of the years. We need to fast track the RMG model. The success stories of the RMG needs to be uh, added to the sectors that ha that have the potential. There are uh, sectors that has been identified by the government uh, which needs uh, duplication, replication of the RNG in terms of the special benefits. Uh, one area where I, I'm, 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 I'm very interested to see the government come up with policies is the outward investment for Bangladeshi companies 
to not only uh, buy companies for for your supply chain, but also to acquire uh, technical know-how. Uh, so, so for example, if a company from Bangladesh wants to invest in Malaysia today, they cannot invest. They have to go through a very stringent process. I, I don't know if there is a process itself, but uh, the government should have policies whereby you you go and buy companies, you get the technology, you get the skill set, and you bring it to Bangladesh, or you become a regional player. So those kind of wealth creation for Bangladesh companies and Bangladeshis need to be a priority area for, for, for the government to look into. And that would automatically reduce your supply side gaps and also create uh, your supply side management by having a common bonded facility for your local industry to, to uh, diversify what, what we have done in the RMG model, something similar. And number three would be to make the SEZ successful. We have 100 SEZs coming up. So in the LDC graduation process, it is very important for the government to make the SEZ successful. I'm not saying make 100 SEZs, at least make 10 successful SEZ where you bring investments uh, uh, into Bangladesh and also create the investment climate. Uh, increase engagement of private public partnership for FDI in, in terms of infrastructure. Uh, if you look at Bangladesh, uh, we don't have a logistic uh, policy itself. Uh, so we need a national logistic strategy, national logistic policy in terms of logistic. We are quite, quite uh, far below the standards uh, compared to other countries in the region. Uh, so that is something where we need to build our competitiveness. Uh, skills, uh, invest in skills, training, research, uh, is very important. Innovation, R&D is what, what should be one of the top priorities of the government. Uh, there are uh, examples abroad where you know, gov if you invest um, uh, in, in R&D or innovation, the government also matches or gives a matching fund. I mean, those kind of innovation should come in. So where do I, not only industries, but also universities are, are spending money on research and innovation. I think that that is, that is something Bangladesh is lacking quite a bit. Uh, so, so at the very end, I would like to emphasize that Bangladesh needs to broaden or needs to increase its competitiveness. We are competitive in certain areas. By default, we are competitive. Now we need to actually plan our competitiveness and create the competitive advantage in within the roadmap of things. So once again, uh, Mr. President, thank you for inviting me. I would like to thank the Ministry of Commerce and Haka Chembo for organizing this very important and timely session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You mentioned the importance of skills and R&D, which is needless to mention is going to be a key driver post-graduation. At the same time, uh, the infrastructure setup is here, as you mentioned, and we also addressed in the inaugural ceremony the 100 economic zones, the 28 high-tech parks, the 10 export processing zones, the API park for pharmaceuticals. But in your deliberation, you mentioned that the RMG success model should be applied across the board because of the nurturing of the government for this such sector. Made in Bangladesh has put Bangladesh on the global map. At the same time, when the prime minister in her inaugural address was talking about export diversification, market diversification and product diversification, she clearly mentioned that she wanted us to diversify our export basket which also goes to show her interest in the diversification, which means that across the board of all these important sectors that are emerging right now, we should be giving the same facilities as the RMG, starting from the bonded warehouse to the incentives and many others. So eventually these individual sectors can maybe one day bring the $38 billion from each of these sectors that has been that RMG has provided in the last one or one, one two years. Thank you, sir, for your deliberation, and we will take into account your comments on the outcome report as requested by the principal secretary, which I will personally deliver to him. At this point of time, I would like to bring in a very senior trade negotiator and a trade policy analyst, Dr. Mustafa Abid Khan, who is a former member of the Bangladesh Tariff and Trade Commission. Uh, he's had a vast experience in working with the WTO, the Tariff Commission, and done trade negotiations on behalf of Bangladesh in many capacities. So therefore, I would like to request Dr. Khan to share us how Bangladesh can better negotiate in realizing the trade benefit later economic graduation and fix tariff structure to support both in local international market. I will just 
but in with one more comment from one of the senior ministers who once told me personally that when we go to negotiate in Brussels or elsewhere in the European Union, we go with a team of 15, 20 people, while on the other side of the table, there is two, 300 lawyers and you know industrialists and businesses, which puts us in a very small spot. So how can we up the negotiating game on behalf of Bangladesh? Over to you, Dr. Khan. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sir. So, firstly, you know, thank you very much for inviting me for this important session. As we see that, you know, I will start uh, from actually from my thinking about the graduation. It's a, it's a graduation, it's, a, it's like a university graduation. So, if when you graduate from the university, you fight, will fight that we have, have graduated. Uh, so, but graduation has come up with new challenges. So, that means I graduated, that means I will not get any support from my parents. So I have to leave. So that's the graduation of our fight, but you see that the problem will be that we will not get support. That's the important issue. And we need to address that. So you see that, you know, when you think about the graduation, you know, it's not uh, in other areas, in agriculture, in service, there is no problem. Problem only in the state and external sector. That's not the problem. We can be, we actually face the you know, challenges in the sector. So, uh, and then you know that when you talk about this, you know, that uh, graduation, we talk about the international support measures, then the Bangladesh concentration is on play. So, you see that uh, uh, someone may say that uh, the aid also is an important component, but uh, you know, aid has minimum linkage with graduation. So that's it. Only pay. So let me think about how you know we can actually overcome the challenges of pay. The challenges is that you know we are going to enter a non reciprocal a non -reciprocal, reciprocal arrangement to reciprocal arrangement. So that's the issue. So we are going to lose the innovative differences. The first one is that you see that you know that uh, one issue is that you know how we are ready to pay graduation and continue our export. So let me actually focus, you know, that uh, first about logistic infrastructure, human, uh, physical and human infrastructure. So you know that the government has been investing in physical infrastructure. So our competitiveness will increase eventually if we put up a good physical infrastructure. Then we have, you know, the uh, our sector development and uh, sector development secretary already said about it. So you know that I, I remember in the 90s we had a problem, a good problem with power. So now we don't have this problem. So our company we have you know that uh, you know uh, the physical inspection is okay. The main problem we face and I see that you know uh, from the technology um, bank also he mentioned about is education, you know. And research. We need to invest in quality education. That is very important. Unless we invest in quality education, we cannot increase on the human resource capacity in doing things. That is very important. So we need to focus on the quality of education. You know that I know that uh, we have you know that the rate of education is much higher, but the quality of education is very important so that you know that uh, we can actually generate young people who can contribute to the research and development. That is very important. And the only research and development, I want to say that, you know, that if you go to other countries, you will see that, you know, industry has an, you know, uh, linkage with the university. And they actually fund universities to be research. But here in Bangladesh, what they are doing, that we actually fund individuals. And that's a problem. We need to fund the universities so that they can do research. And that is very important. And in that way, we can actually develop our research and development. So, and now we have in also ACJ, we have we have to it like that. So let me go to this, you know, this main problem of the trade. So you see that around 75% of our trade actually going uh, export is going to other countries having limited frequent access. And um, at time to actually 
trying our, um, our best to get the preference after the graduation. As of today, the European Union, UK, and Turkey also did uh, the preferences after three years. After three years. But the problem is that you see that you know, if we you know that we are yes, aspires to become a high middle income country by 2035. And if we, we can reach that one, there will be no G3 facilities from UK and from uh, European Union. Because the military has got their rules, if you become the high middle income country, you will not get any G3. So that's a, also an important uh, issue you have to deal with. So there is no option but to prepare ourselves to enter into a risk for the work. So when you talk about the reciprocity, that means so if you want to enter into FTA or with other countries, we have to take, under we have to undertake the same obligation like others. So we have to reduce uh, our tariff, we have to reduce our you know, we have to comply with the other regulation. So important thing that, that I think that you see that in order to prepare ourselves for the uh, graduation, we need to diversify our product. And you see that uh, this uh, we only export, you know, around 80% of our export is treatment countries. And you can get that one. Ready-made garments only. Ready-made garments actually the developed country, developed country import seventy percent of our, of ready-made garments in the world. So developed developing country has minimum demand on ready-made garments. So if we want to have FTA with many uh, other developing countries with their small ready-made garments. That will be not you know, effective. So we need to diversify our product. And you see, diversify, how to diversify our product? You know, you know here I want to actually ask the private sector thing. And you see that it's not the you know, RMG, if you uh, everybody give the example of RMG. You see that RMG, the, the sector, are actually divided into two segments. One, is only producing for export. Other one is producing for domestic consumption. You see, but in other sectors, that is not happening. In other sectors, you know, those who are producing for domestic market, they are also producing for the export. So here, if you think that we need to increase our competitiveness, we need to rationalize our tax. You see, that, you know, they are giving this, uh, you know, the tariff is in such a way that domestic market is more lucrative than the export market. So if we don't rationalize the tariff, the private sector, nobody, you know, that if I am a businessman, I will not be interested to, you know, go for export. So, you know, the domestic market is more lucrative. Why should I go for it? So that's why, you know, that, uh, you know, we need to prepare our industry to increase competitiveness. And that's why we need Tariff nationalization that is very important, and the Honorable Commerce Secretary has mentioned that one. That we need to nationalize our tariff, that is very important. And you see that you know, the private sector has to think how to get competitiveness without any support, monetary, financial support from the government. That is very important. You see that we are actually um, um, getting the six, yeah, 6,300 crore every year as export cash incentive. So you see that's the support and you see that when you graduate from the LBC status we cannot take this support. That's a problem. So that's why let us prepare for increasing the competitiveness of the industry. And that's why we need to change our policy. The policy for the tariff nationalization, tariff nationalization, policy for cash incentive and policy for the uh, investment. That is very important. Is we need to develop a policy which is conducive for the domestic investment and the foreign investment. That is very important. If foreign investment come, technology will come automatically. That's the technology, technical know-how will come. And we can actually absorb this technology and increase our industrial
That is very important. And negotiating FTA, how I can negotiate or you can negotiate FTA, the campaign for policy environment. You see, that's very important, you know. Otherwise, you know, what will happen that we can go for negotiation, but I cannot move because my policy does not allow us to move forward. So that is very important. And I think that, you know, it is very important for the private sector to think how to do that. And otherwise, the government cannot help. I know that we have an experience in Indonesia, in Nepal, what happened. We could not move without policy. So that is very important. We need to change how to um, we need to change our policy so that you know we can effectively negotiate with the other countries. And um, you know, I have my personal observation that you know, don't think about the PDA. You know, if you have a PDA, that means their cost of negotiation will be much higher than the benefit of, uh, you know, FTA. So it's better to enter into FTA and prepare for that. And for that one, we need to change our policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa Abid Khan. There was a lot of points uh, we have uh, jotted down. And of course, negotiation skills that we keep talking about must be addressed in order to gain the competitiveness in negotiations first and then eventually move on to being a competitive country as a whole and of course uh, we have also heard from Yasim regarding the importance of tech transfer and i hope that in the upcoming negotiations at the wto there will be a more resilient uh, and uh, i must not use the word aggressive but more resilient uh, approach from the bangladesh government and of course as you mentioned, the importance of the private sector, hence we always advocate the fact that the importance of uh, inclusive stakeholder consultation between the Ministry of Commerce and the private sector must go on. So at this point of time, we have heard everyone uh, of our designated discussions, and uh, I'm not going to uh, elaborate by introducing Mr. Sayed Manzuri Lahi, as he needs no introduction, but however, I have seen that we have a lot of uh, discussions, uh, international participants here. Before that, uh, uh, Mr. Arman Hock, you ro rose your hand. Did you want to say something? Arman? Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I would just like to say a few words to supplement uh, previously what Mr. Abu Qasim Khan said. Um, I feel Bangladesh in a, is in a very proactive trajectory trying to get for it direct foreign investment. And that is actually very wonderful. And we do see some traction in the recent years. However, I wanted to bring up one thing, and this is where the supplement comes in, is that business is now globalized. It does not understand political boundaries. Competition is part of a greater global scale that includes multiple countries, foreign trade, foreign export, foreign investment, Bangladeshi manufacturers and entrepreneurs are ready to also explore overseas lands and they're ready to make factories. If our government also promotes in the future uh, Bangladeshi entrepreneurs to invest abroad, of course with check and balances. So not, it's not just a free ticket to go and invest abroad without any uh, uh, check and balance. It should be uh, reciprocal. And I think we will do very good in the major landscape because today we are so Bangladesh centric. However, the same manufacturers such as uh, Mr. Syed Manzo Elahi sir, I'm sure they can go and they can make multiple factories globally and they can do a very good job because the business acumen they have is actually for a global scale, not just a Bangladesh scale. So this is something I would like to see uh, promoted in the future because if you look at a company, for example, like Thailand, 40, 50 years ago, I've heard, not that I have seen, I was not born then, but I've heard that Bangladesh and Thailand were on similar scales. It's an unfair comparison because they're a larger country, much more resources and smaller population. But CP Group has been in Bangladesh since 1991 and they're doing very well here. So just like that, I feel our Bangladeshi entrepreneurs can do well in other countries with the right promotion. And that is really one of the big generators of business growth is to get foreign assets. Today, when you are in London and you see the nice hotel, you see it's owned by Brunei. And, uh, you know, that's the beauty of business and the globalized world we live in. And that is something I would like to see promoted in the future. Thank you very much, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you, Arman. Ladies and gentlemen, Arman is a colleague of mine in the board of DCCI. And interestingly, this is something we have always voiced that even though we don't have a law that allows us to uh, invest abroad, now we do, but you know, it's more, more complicated than it seems. And we have only had a handful of companies that have invested abroad. But if this is made open, regardless of the law, investments or capital flight is leaving the country, whether officially or unofficially. But if we put them on the record, then the government will have access to that information. And those success stories can actually come back to Bangladesh and also help brand Bangladesh abroad. So thank you, Arman. And this is something we will definitely, even though we have proposed multiple times, but we, the private sector, will not stop. We will keep doing until the government one day allows. Because India is a company, uh, back in the days when they were in heavy debt, they still allowed $200,000 per national to invest abroad. And look at where India is today. So therefore, there is a success behind that. So we need to follow those examples. And uh, as I was uh, introducing our guest of honor, uh, who has given leadership in the Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and Industry in the FBCCI, uh, in the education field, he's the chairperson of the East-West University, the Board of Trustees of East-West University, and has given leadership in the government. He was a former advisor to the caretaker government of Bangladesh. And so we have also received an interesting question from the floor that in Bangladesh, the present tax regime charges AIT and VAT on technology transfer when paid through technical know-how fees and adding more than 20% to the actual cost. Do we believe that this will help Bangladesh gain more technology faster? I'm not going to answer that question and I'm going to leave that for you. And of course, you have been a champion in the industrial development of the country as already mentioned by today's chief guest. And we would like you to share your experience of the industrial change later graduation. And you have seen the last 50 years of the transformation of Bangladesh and how the transformation would be post-graduation and the likely policy reforms for competitiveness of local businesses, which again, we have also championed in creating a brand in Bangladesh. And, and, and we can also talk about the environment required for the smooth economic transition and the transformation as mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Syed Manzuri Lahi. Thank you. Thank you, Rizwan, for those uh, very, very flattering words. Uh, 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 in your letter, you, uh, your uh, Dhaka Chamber sent me a letter where they said that please speak on the leather goods and the uh, footwear industry. Now it's more at macroeconomic that you are referring to. So what should I speak on? So on you should both because our demand from you is very high. So, of course, uh, you have changed the uh, transformation of the leather industry, of course, which is one of the early export diversification. The reason why the leather sector is now the second uh, largest exporter and you, are, you started the industry revolution in Bangladesh. We want to hear on that. And as I mentioned, the prime minister kept talking about uh, the diversification of the export basket. But this is something your industry, your company has already started a long time ago. And at the same time, we also want you to talk about the policy reforms post-graduation. Thank you, sir. How much time are you giving me? As much How as much you, time are you going, I, I going to give me? Leave until you finish speaking. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I think you're running the answer. I won't waste any more time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been hearing... Uh, very, some of the points were very, very interesting, and especially I didn't realize uh, that United Nations has a bank also uh, for technology, and it was very interesting to hear Ms. Uh, Yasim uh, talk about this. And uh, I heard very good points from Topic Rahman and uh, other speakers. Asim, of course, as usual, you know, is an expert on uh, the skills technical know-how and uh, in my uh, more or less about 50 years of experience in the leather and leather goods industry, I won't talk on that, but I'll talk definitely on the uh, what we have learned from this. Uh, we, have, we have come a long way because I started business in 1972 when the country, the economy was devastated. I won't spend too much time on it because we have to look to the future and not the past. But we can learn a lot from the past also. Uh, those, the, those were the days of uh, permits and uh, you know, 
licenses. So half of my time used to go uh, walking down the corridors of uh, the secretariat, uh, getting rid of uh, government rules and regulations. And so it was quite a nightmare. Uh, so as I said, half of my time used to go and lobbying with the government to to liberal, uh, liberalize the trade environment. Uh, having said that, I think uh, in the inaugural uh, speech, the Honorable Prime Minister has mentioned about export diversification. Uh, she has mentioned this many times. She has mentioned this uh, in our association uh, meetings in various uh, seminar where we, she was uh, physically present uh, because there was no pandemic there. And, uh, and people have been talking about export diversification for a long time. But somehow it hasn't happened. If somehow something is blocking. Somebody has said uh, uh, that, okay, uh, I think uh, Dr. Abed, I think, has said that he said, Abit Khan, yes, Dr. Abit Khan has said that if the local industry is more profitable, why should I bother about uh, the export market? Well, I beg to differ because you can do both. You can do the export market as, uh, as well as you can do the local market. And <clears throat> uh, both have their advantages. In the local market, there will be, you see, any business, if they want to succeed in that business, there has to be growth. Without growth, the business will die. And uh, there are limitations in the domestic market. It's it's not uh, you know it's absolutely not open end. It's not boundless. There are boundaries. And uh, so then you have to go. For example, take even in the Western world, take the case of Mercedes Benz, Benz company. Only thirty percent of the production is sold in Europe which is okay, you. 70% are exported out because this is a small country. Similarly, you know, we have to both. The ideal thing is to do both. Why? Because I think the most important thing for any uh, LDC or a, or a country that is going to graduate to uh, very recently to developing jobs, seeking jobs, you have to create jobs. That is the easiest way to alleviate poverty. And that has to be done by the private sector. Why? Because private sector creates the job and there's something in the pipeline. There's goods are being produced. Whereas if you invest in the, in the government offices only, they are very necessary because without government, a company cannot run. But it's not as productive as in the private sector. The five percent. It was previously three and a half percent before the pandemic. Now it's five percent. The five percent of 160 million people is a lot of people. So you have to create jobs, and if you have to create jobs, you need industries. You need. It can be manufacturing industry. It can be in the service industry. It can be any industry. Service industry. Service contributes 51 percent to the GDP. There's industries of the 18 percent. So, but you need industry because you need those workers also because not everybody is skilled. And I think somebody pointed out very rightly where just the other day I was speaking at, uh, at the university's convocation as a convocation speaker. And I said my biggest complaint against this as uh, uh, it was pointed out by a uh, speaker that or another weak link is the HR, human resources. Thousands and thousands of foreigners are working in Bangladesh. And officially, you're remitting $5 billion. $5 billion. So unofficially, another $4, 5000000000 billion. A country like Bangladesh, any country cannot afford this you know, outflow of the hard and foreign exchange, which is being earned by the exporters and by the wage earners, I call them the unsung heroes. So we have to diversify, we have to do export, not only in the local industry, but to export also. Now, if I bring it down to, if I make it more micro, where do I see why this leather industry is not stuck? We should have been on a different level. 
Let me give you some figures, ladies and gentlemen. As of today, the global market for footwear only is $365 billion. By 2040, it is estimated by the Footwear Association of the World, World Footwear Association, that is going to touch half a trillion dollars, $500 trillion. So even if we capture 1% of that in the export market, it's almost $4 billion. And if you capture 2%, it's a lot of money, number one. Number two is it's labor intensive. Like garment industry, it is labor. It's not so capital intensive, but there is this problem. A garment is two-dimensional, it's a length and width. Whereas shoes are three-dimensional. There's a length, there's a width, and there's a depth. So it requires a lot of tooling. Tooling cost is too long. It requires a lot of technology transfer, which I'm very happy to meet uh, this CS with. Maybe yes, and I can contact you later on. We, from our own private sector, we have set up a training center where we pick up absolutely unskilled. Kasim knows about it, I think. Uh, Bella. And we teach them to know how because we cannot have just like in garment industry that people just come from the villages, you teach them how to run a swing machine and they're absorbed in the, in the uh, industry, the RNG, not so in footwear. Footwear, you have to cut the leather. It's a natural product. Two pieces of leather are not the same. Whereas in the garment industry, you buy millions of uh, electric of cloth and you just keep on cutting and you know, you're producing this robotic. Uh, footwear cannot be robotic because each piece of leather is different. So you have to use your know-how to cut the leather. In short, you need a lot of technology. You just can't do it like that. Now, who are the leaders in this line? China. Previously, 10 years ago, it was about 70 to 80 percent of the world production China is to make. Now it's come down to about 60 percent. Still, the biggest player. Next came Vietnam. From Vietnam started their first factory in 1990. We started our first factory in 1990. Vietnam has over 3,000 factories, footwear factories. We are stuck with about two, three hundred. Vietnam's export of footwear is somewhere in the region of 16 to 17 billion dollars. We are stuck at one billion dollars, not even a billion dollars. So where did we go wrong? The third player is Indonesia. And the fourth coming up very fast is India. India has finally realized that instead of just concentrating on high tech and IT, we should, they should also go for labor intensive industries. And they have praised Bangladesh because we stuck to labor intensive industries. Because you have to create wealth, even for the domestic industry. If the people, the population is poor, what future does a domestic industry have? Where is the purchasing power? So both are very important. Now, why we just cannot you know, really do well as the R&D sector? apart from the technology transfer, is another is the image problem. Still today, the image problem has improved definitely uh, as compared to say maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, because of the ready-made government. But somehow here, I, I would like if the, ministry, if the secretary minister from, is he there? This one? Yes, he's, he's in the cabinet as well. Oh, I see. Okay. Then he would have been very, he, can, he could have bored me out, you know, bailed me out. Uh, the ready made garment industry, the facilities that they enjoy, I have nothing against it. But those same benefits have to be given to other export oriented industries. We are not on the same page. As others, like, you know, the government and government government industry, for whatever reasons, they get a lot of uh, uh, help from the government. 
when we hear of those facilities, then we have to go. In short, we are not on the same page. Okay. Second is that, as somebody rightly pointed out, this has to be the footwear industry that has to take off. We need a joint venture in the initial stages. If you analyze the footwear industry of China and Vietnam, they are all joint ventures. Joint venture mainly by who? By the Taiwanese. Most of the shoe industries, the big industries, so the biggest chip maker in the whole world is Taiwanese. So the Taiwanese are entrepreneurs, the owners of the industry, the factories are in China. And this has developed over the years. There's nothing against it. The transfer effect. So somehow I know because I am a joint venture with the Taiwan issue factory in Bangladesh. And when I told them that why you have come, he said, because I have factory in China, I have factory in Vietnam, and now I've realized there is no future in China and Vietnam. That is what I'm trying to get at. It is exactly because the Chinese government is no longer interested in footwear industry, leather goods industry, in leather industry, they are interested in high-tech industries. And so labor shortage, which was aggravated by one child policy. And now they can't get back, even though they give incentive, they can't get back to two child or three child, three children because they are not interested. Now here a time has come that this is the question of timing. The time is just right for us to open up. And we have to open up with the big companies. We have to open up with Nike, with Adidas. These are the big guys. This is where you get <coughs> a lot of volume. For that, still as of today, these big companies, Nike editors, they don't invest even one dollar in an industry. They just give you the order and they give you the product and you make it. Now, if you again analyze the Chinese footwear industry and the Britain, as I said, there are huge factories. The Nike factory in Vietnam that I've been employs something like 70,000 workers. And these are all high-tech machinery. Even in uh, stitching machine, you, have, you can have high-tech also. And they have employed those, those know-how can be brought into Bangladesh by the Taiwanese Americans. What do they need? How, why we are not able to attract them? They are frantically looking for countries. They can't go to Thailand, the wages are very high. They can't go to Laos, it's landlocked. They can't go to Cambodia, the population is too small. Where will they go? Even Turkey, which is a leader in footwear, and Turkey is leader in leather. I mean, Miss, yes, I think you're Turkish, right? You know better than me. They, they, I've seen their leather garments. They are ex excellent. I mean, their products are excellent. Even they are feeling the pinch because the labor cost is very high. They can't afford Nike. They cannot afford Adidas because it's too labor intensive and they are priced out. Even Turkish have had inquiries from Turkey investors. They want to come to Bangladesh. Very, very interesting. But they're not coming. Where have we gone wrong? Land. I keep on telling the government that this is not only labor intensive, not very capital intensive, but it's also very land intensive. Indeed, it's a lot of land. And a time has come where you, Ridwan, you have talked about, you've talked about special economic zone and whatnot. There should be a special economic zone for footwear industry, footwear and other goods industry. It can be anywhere, it can be in North Bengal, it can be because now the communication is improving. Kasem Ratli pointed out the logistic problems. That will be there, that we can solve. But that is 
common for all industries. That is not common only for the leather industry, footwear industry. So that is a macro level problem. Since Rizwan told me to, to concentrate on the footwear, and this can be a fantastic export diversification. We will not reach uh, the figures of ready-made garment industry because a, a consumer may buy five shirts, but he will not going to buy five pairs of shoes. But a pair of shoe, the average price of a pair of shoe is over $15, whereas the garment is much cheaper. So your volume goes up. I mean, export earning goes up. So first is land, if you want to know. First, I said, before that, we have to be on the same page, benefit-wise, with the ready-made garment industry. Every time they get, a, they get a benefit, like say, no duty on spare parts, it's only given to RNG, it's not given to us. We are also exporting. Then again, we have to go, we have to lobby through our association, and then we get the permission. That has to go. Export policy should be the same for all sectors of the industry. You just cannot you know, give stepmotherly treatment to other sectors and just garment RMG, RMG. I know they're, they're the favorite child of the government, but there are other children also. You have to look after them also. So that is it. the same page. They have to be on the same page. Number two, there has to be special economic zone. And fortunately, our prime minister is extremely leather and footwear oriented person. I've seen this with my own eyes because when we, our association, we hold an exhibition, she doesn't go to other associations meet, but she comes to our meeting, the annual meeting. Of course, those are pre pandemic time. Now, so we can get a lot of support from this government. We have been driving this. If the API can have a separate economic zone, separate land, why can't the footprint industry have? Where it's more labor intense, millions of people can be absorbed. <coughs> and that the training, as I said, that can be also solved because we have the technology transfer mechanism all over the world. If the business is more that Technology transfer, the entrepreneur, the joint venture partner will bring the technology. Don't worry about it. I've seen this. It is happening. I because I have practical, practical experience. We don't have to go to United Nations or we don't have to go to Ampac. We don't have to go anywhere. My joint venture partner will bring the technology. So this is it makes life much simpler. My joint venture partner. In Taiwan, just on a lighter note, six in the morning, before the workers go to the factory, they do exercise. Everybody is on the field, and they are and these are per shift is about three thousand workers. Three thousand workers are in the field and they're doing exercise. Then there are about seventeen or eighteen Chinese working in the, in the factory. They are transferring the technology, so that will come. But Create the environment. How do you create the environment? Give them the land, give them the facilities, give them you know, the incentive. If enough incentives are there. All we have to do is import, improve the port situation <coughs> because it's terrible. Lead time is very important. Shoes are a very fashionable item. There are two distinct light garments the spring, summer fashion, or and there is autumn winter, two different types. You have, you have a different pair of shoes you wear in autumn winter, if you wear a different pair of shoes in summer, spring, summer. One is more sandal, one is more cover. So these are fashionable. The colors are fashionable. So these things, I'm not worried about the technology transfer. We leave me cassette. I'm not so worried. All we need is a partner, joint venture partner. That is the only way to do it. China has done it, Vietnam has done it. Indonesia is still very much dependent. If Nike and Adidas and all these people can go to Indonesia, why can't they come to Bangladesh? But whenever they come, I, I think Nike came here 20 years ago. They wanted land. They saw, they said, we don't want a local partner, which is fine. Let them come. They create jobs. 
and then slowly you know we we will pick it up i mean when with the garment interest started nurul qader khan and then he took about 40 people to south korea to daewoo you know, all those 40 workers who went with him are to be all entertainers the owners of garment industry so this will happen like that so i can go on but there's a shortage of time uh but i'm not worried about all the macroeconomic problems all i'm worried about very fundamental very basic give us land give us a special economic zone i said this many many times i told this we have told this from the association to the prime minister on the prime minister and somehow it's lost somewhere in the bureaucracy i don't know what happens and make the as you rightly pointed out the transfer of technology fees why 20% tax on that doesn't make sense to me it has to go because this they said that we are giving you the know how and then you know you are taxing here and that taxation it's not adjusted even in their own country somehow it's not recognized so these are the points but i think if you are is this is the right time why i am emphasizing this is because because of you know in the last uh, one month vietnamese government suddenly went and closed about 50% of the factories because of the covid this has shaken the the the, uh, the foreign buyers big buyers like as i said like adidas clarks timberland these are all big guys and now they are they previously they used to never reply to our email now they're showing a lot of interest because they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket up till now they had all their eggs in the basket of china vietnam Indonesia, there is another problem, so work ethic problems, and you know there are other problems. But now they are shaken up, so they're looking. And this is the time, ladies and gentlemen, that we have to create the environment. So let them come. With that, the transfer of technology will come. Job creation will be there. Life is much simpler. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. um i think uh, it's been quite uh, experience for us and the fact that we requested a guest of honor to speak and we got a complimentary keynote instead so uh, that was a bit of a learning session for all of us and uh, of course uh, you have raised some very very interesting points which i'll be very delighted to make an outcome report and deliver to the principal secretary myself i wish she was there and uh, Just tell him, give us land, special economic zone land, special facility, definitely. and you see what will happen. We will it has definitely. happened in Turkey, it happened in Vietnam, it happened everywhere. It happened. You don't want to have to go into all this paraphernalia of you know this and that and transfer and negotiating. No, just give us land and the facility and the facilities, tax facilities. Without without uh, without any of these facilities, you have been able to create a. a product that is uh, exported to so many countries and known by the whole world so imagine the uh, opportunities that will arise for all the new entrepreneurs if these facilities are given there will be more apex uh, com- companies like apex in the market which will eventually help bangladesh grow further and of course you mentioned the tech tech transfer issue and of course this is something uh, technology like i said it, at the very uh, outset that it's no longer a choice it's a necessity and we will definitely place the outcome report and interestingly uh dcci has been holding various seminars and webinars and discussions but this one is actually a joint initiative of the ministry of commerce and the dhaka chamber of commerce and industry so definitely when we make a proposal it, which also comes from the ministry of commerce so definitely i will have a word with my co-host uh, today mr tapan kanti ghosh he just messaged me and he did send his apologies for not being able to because the prime minister has been kind enough to reschedule her uh, cabinet meeting because she wanted to attend our inaugural uh, ceremony of the bangladesh trade and investment summit that is why the uh, the appointment has been set today for the cabinet meeting which is ongoing right now and i will definitely make an outcome report and i want to uh, thank each and every one of you for the last 1 hour and the 45 minutes you have spent with us i wish we could open the floor for more questions but unfortunately despite the shortage of time it hasn't been done 
But thank you very much, each and every one of your special discussions. I also uh, express my gratitude to the uh, introductory remarks made by the Commerce Secretary, as well as the Chief Guest, our Principal Secretary. And needless to mention, thank you, sir, for guiding us and sharing your experience with us. The guest of honor today, Sayyid Manzurilahi. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.